So we're going to get started. Um, so last class we did the, uh, at the end, uh, the reflection papers where you guys gave me just a little bit of feedback on how you're finding the class and, um, and how it's working for you so far. So I just want to comment on a few things. I, th I think most people are on board with what, what we're doing. I think a lot of people are finding it kind of interesting, intellectually stimulating, eye-opening in a way in, in the sense that we're challenging a lot of the assumptions that maybe you don't get a sense to, or a chance to tease apart in some of your other classes. Um, some people are experiencing you know, some confusion and some difficulty kind of in understanding. Um, and you know, to that I would, I would say, I guess, well, just keep it up, keep working at it. Um, um, the other thing is, is that in the last class in particular, like when, when you're working from a theoretical model and you have a term like information or you have a term like representation and that term seems to be used in sort of ambiguous ways or it's used in one context in one sense, another context in another sense. And if, if, you, if you don't pay attention to it, if you just assume what you think it's supposed to, to mean, then you'll save yourself some confusion. But the moment you try to pay attention to what is this person doing or how is this being used and is this appropriate, then what can happen is that you, you will feel yourself a little bit disoriented, but that may not be you so much as the theory that is a bit muddled up. And so our job is to try to clarify that as best we can, right? Um, there was one student who commented uh, that they don't see how what we're doing is related to personality. And to that, I would just remind everyone that uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand, well, what is a person? How, why does a person think and feel and act in the ways that they do? And how does that kind of remain stable over time? So we're trying to make sense of that. But arguably, first, we have to get clear on, well, what is a person? What is a person's way of being in the world, right? Is a person's way of being in the world the same as like a rat or a pigeon or a computer or a robot? And and if not, why not? And, and let's kind of get clear on that um, before we get into like our, our interpretations of a particular individual. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, others are, are there's a, a few people asking for more concrete real life examples. I think that we'll get into a lot of that. We should get a lot of that today. Um, and I would just encourage you that if you feel like there's a need for an example, or if the example that I give is not really a good one, or it's, it's not particularly clear, just put up your hand and, and say, look, professor, could you give us another example? Um, and I'm more than happy to do that, OK? Um, some people are wondering how to study for the test. We have a test on Tuesday. OK. So that's in terms of the, uh, the focus. The other thing is that when we're, we're working here with concepts, we're working here with ideas, we're working here with frame, frameworks. This isn't the kind of test that you can just memorize things, right? In order to, to get a feel for these concepts, you have to practice them. You have to work with it. Uh, the best way to study would be to sit down with someone, I think, and try to explain something to them, OK? So you know, grab a friend, grab a family member, whatever, sit down, have a coffee, pour a tea, and say, look, I'm going to try to explain to you this thing that I'm learning in class. It's called formal cause. And it's really complicated, but I'm going to try my best to explain it. And let's see if it makes any sense to you, right? Or I'm going to sit down and I'm going to explain as best as I can the differences between a computer or a robot and a person. And I'm going to see if that makes any sense, right? Or the other thing that you can do is, is you just try writing some of this down. If you had to, to state a case or, or make an argument in line with some of the things that we've been dis discussing here, you write it down, then you look at it and see if it makes sense. Right? The worst thing that you could do is come into the test and hope to just toss some of these words, throw it at the page, and, and hope that something sticks. That's the, the worst thing that you could do. The other thing, just to, I don't want to scare people, but just because it's maybe different from some of the, like, uh, the other courses that you might have taken, or particularly courses where you just you know, multiple choice, fill in the blank type things, um, people who aren't used to that sort of thing, it, it may be very difficult for you. It, it, you might be taken aback just how hard that test is. So don't take it lightly. Um, take it seriously. Put in the work. The thing that I notice over the years is, is that like in a class like this, there's such a wide range of ability. There's people who kind of get what we're doing, and they're right on board, and they recognize that it's tough and it's hard, and that's what a fourth year course should be. And there's other people who, you know, they haven't showed up for the first three classes. They still don't understand the difference between an argument based on opinions versus reasons. 
and they're going to come in and they're going to they're going to bomb the test, right? That's just what happens. So, uh, put in the work. It's it's worth the effort, and um, I'm here to help you out uh, if you need it. So, uh, I think it should be clear just based on what I've been emphasizing, like the things to focus on, right? So, some basic things that you want to know. Uh, you know, just the, our working definition of personality. You want to know uh, just some basic modes of investigation that we're working from. Definitely you want to get really comfortable with the four causes. There's the study aid that should help you with that. There's also video links with uh, uh, Professor Anton kind of explaining from his point of view, like how to make sense of this. Um, so work with it and, and try to get comfortable with it. Um, you want to understand the nature of conceptual communities. You want to be able to understand, like, well, why do they tend toward dogmatism? Why do theorists from different uh, conceptual paradigms seem to talk past one another, right? Um, and, and how do we, you know, try to remedy that situation as best we can? Um, what is the Duham Quine thesis? Why is that relevant? Um, and with regard to the theories, the two theories that we've covered so far, behaviorism and information processing theory. You just want to maybe say something about, well, what are the theoretical assumptions of this model? What seems to be like the causal framework that it's prioritizing? What are the contexts where the application of that paradigm is appropriate? And what are the contexts where we might argue that it's an overextension of that paradigm? Right? You guys with me on all that? Does that make sense? OK. So that leads us right up to this slide. Um, so if a theory of the person cannot be reduced to material or efficient causes, if we're justified in thinking that a proper theory must account for formal final causes, then the cognitive and the evolutionary psychology approaches will be lacking. They can only distort a proper understanding of what it is to be a person. So again, it's not that you can't work within this framework and, and say that, well, this is what my, my paradigm deals with. It's that you have to appreciate that, well, if there's more to what it is to be a person, you have to recognize that there's th this other paradigm over here that comes into play. And then you have to know that, OK, where does my theory end and, and where does this other theory begin? Because that's really important when we get into the hypothesis testing. If I want to set up a null hypothesis that is from this framework, I want to take that framework seriously and not make a caricature of it, right? Um, so another way of putting this is, you know, that old saw that if the only tool that you have in a toolbox is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, if the only conceptual framework that you have is material efficient causality, then everything starts to look like mechanisms, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, there are, though, obviously some ways in, in which a mechanistic mode of theorizing or an information processing mode of theorizing are, are quite appropriate. So areas of uh, where the information processing approach can bear some utility. So learning and memory. So there's, there's obviously some kind of uh, uh, biological constraints or mechanistic constraints or processing constraints that explain certain phenomena, like why short-term memory seems to have a duration of roughly 30 seconds, um, why um, our working memory, you know, there seems to be a magic number of seven digits that we're able to hold on to and, and recall, give or take two digits. Um, it's relevant perhaps within the neurobiology of perception, within neuropsychology. So if we engage in certain attentional tasks and memory tasks, um, and we kind of see just the distribution of, of how people perform on these tasks, we can make inferences about the functioning of this person's uh, brain, their nervous system, and, and possible lesions or deficits. And then uh, in the therapy world, there's uh, some ways in which this plays into cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy is this sort of, when I said that it's confusing, uh, it's, this would be an example of it because it seems like cognitive behavioral therapy has a foot in both camps, right? They're doing therapy with people, obviously. When they talk about representations, presumably it's a representation to a first-person subject who is able to have a thought or a concept or something like that. So obviously, in some sense, they're dealing with formal and final cause. But in another sense, they're working with the computer metaphor to make sense of what they're doing. So, and this is why there's that, that slippage back and forth in these terms and how they're used. So... Um, 
you know, in other words, I think we talked about this last time, we can look at, look at it this way, that when we talk about information processing, right, there's a way in which we can apply that term to computers, there's a way in which we can apply that term to the central nervous system, and these two, you know, parallels, like the, the, the analogy might actually hold to a certain degree because arguably we're working within material efficient cause, but then when we talk about information processing at the level of the self-conscious person or the agent, we might wonder, whoa, you know, are we not talking about something different? In other words, if, if you follow me, there's, there's like an ontological gap between what's happening at the level of mechanism and arguably what's happening at the level of the first person subject or agent. Does that make any sense? Okay, so, but I wanna give uh, uh, an example of what cognitive behavioral therapy might look like and, and what it involves, right? So I'm, I'm first gonna read from, from a text, it's a 2017 text, Robert Leahy, Cognitive Therapy Technique, Techniques, and he just talks about uh, what it involves, so. The cognitive model proposes that depression, anxiety, anger, and other problems are maintained, activated, or exacerbated by biases in thinking. So biases in how we, so thinking is construed as a kind of processing from this model, okay? So there's, there's a situation or a stimulus, there's the thinking or the processing, and then there's like the output, which would be like subsequent thoughts or feelings or behaviors or something like that. At the center of these biases are schemas that are consistent patterns of organizing information around a pre-existing concept. Now, that sounds like a formal cause type thing that they're describing there, right? The cognitive model of therapy places an emphasis on psychoeducation of the patient regarding his or her fundamental assumptions and the approach to be utilized in therapy. Thus, the therapist may indicate to the patient in the first session of therapy that they're going to focus on what the patient is consciously thinking and doing, how he or she looks at things differently and might behave differently, and how self-help homework might help. The cognitive approach stresses the importance of testing the patient's construction of reality against the facts as they become available. So, I'm not a cognitive behavioral therapist, but I will do my best to impersonate one, okay? So if you're a therapist and you're working with a, a patient and this patient is suffering from depression, okay? The session might begin or start out something like this. Um, tell me about your week. You know, what's, what's been happening the past few days? And the client says, well, it's actually been a, a, a bit of a tough week, but you know, Thursday evening in particular was really, really difficult. Okay, well tell me about Thursday evening, what was happening? Well, I was just feeling, that night I was just feeling really low. I was just feeling just lifeless and just really sad and alone and just really horrible. I was in just a really bad state, I was just spiraling. Okay, so walk me through it. What was happening, what time of day was this? Oh, I was in the evening, okay. So walk me through how this unfolded. You know, so what was happening earlier on? Well, I was having dinner with my family, with my parents. Okay, and how are you feeling then? Uh, I was a little bit rattled, I guess, but I was, I was doing okay, I was, I was managing. Okay, and then what happened? Well, then I went up to my room. And were you by yourself? Yes. And then what happened? Well, then I just started feeling terrible. I just felt awful. Okay, so what was happening just prior to this awful feeling coming in? You know, what, what were the automatic thoughts that were coming up at that time? What, what was, where was your mind directed toward? What was happening there? Um, what, what were you considering? What were you mulling about and so on? And the client says, well, I, I just started thinking about, I, I don't have any friends. I don't have anyone to talk to. I'm alone, right? Oh, okay. So you were in the room alone. You were having this thought that I don't have any friends. I don't have anyone to talk to. I'm alone in the world. And then you found yourself feeling terrible. Okay. Can we investigate this thought? Can we look at this thought and, and see, you know, we'll, we'll approach it as if we're, we're scientists and we'll kind of see if there's any evidence to support this thought. So you have this thought that you don't have any friends, okay? Well, so tell me, just humor me here for a minute. Like, when was the last time you talked to another human being that wasn't your family? And the client says, well, I don't know, uh, the bus driver this morning, they said hi to me and, and I said hi back, I suppose. Okay, and prior to that, 
uh, I guess, you know, I was talking to my professor briefly to see if I can get an extension. Okay, and prior to that, well, I was in the library. What were you doing in the library? I was sitting with Susie. Who's Susie? Well, Susie is, you know, someone in my class. She's in another one of my classes. And what were you doing? We were studying economics. Okay, for how long? Three hours. It's a long time to be studying economics. What else did you guys talk about? Well, as a matter of fact, you know, she was talking about some problems that she was having with her roommate, and she was really upset, and I don't know, she's talking to me about that. Oh, well, that's interesting. Why would she talk to you about that? Well, I guess I, I'm a good listener, I guess, and she thought that she could trust me with that. Oh, well, that sounds like something that a friend would do. Well, maybe, I don't know. Well, do you think Susie would consider you a friend? Maybe she might. Ah, okay. And, you know, would you perhaps consider her a friend? Like, do you think that you might be able to do the same, that you might be able to talk to her about, about issues that you're struggling with? Maybe. Okay, so that's interesting. So let's look at this. So we're, we're entertaining the possibility that maybe Susie is a friend, right? Yeah. So when we go back and we look at that initial thought that you have, that I don't have any friends, how strong is that thought right now? Like, how convinced are you of that thought right now after we've kind of dissected it a little bit? Well, it's, it's not as strong. Yeah, so it's not as strong. And, and how does that feel when you notice that? Well, it feels a little bit better, right? That's, uh, I mean, that's, that's a, probably a horrible caricature, but that's roughly what, uh, what a cognitive behavioral therapist might do. So they're, they're very interested in, in thinking and how this person interprets a situation. And of course, that's, uh, that's, that's a, a significant insight, like how we frame the situation, how we interpret what's happening uh, can have a, a great deal of, of uh, bearing on, on how we feel and how we in interact with people. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, one of the empirically supported therapies. It's, you know, uh, proven to be able to reduce symptom severity for, you know, depression, anxiety, phobias, uh, and things of that nature. So um, there are contexts where it's, uh, it's certainly applicable. But yeah, there's a number of things. I, I don't want to get into a rant about, like, what I disagree with, with that model. But um, one of them is, is that, roughly speaking, it seems to assume that much of the time thinking precedes emotion. That, that your thoughts cause you to feel a certain way. And that has some intuitive appeal because a lot of the time that's true. Like you can think yourself into a really sorry state, um, you know, particularly if, if you're a more emotional person. Um, but it's often the case, I would argue, that well, feeling shows up prior to thinking and, and emotions and moods are kind of the ground from which thoughts kind of emerge in a way. They constrain the possibilities of, of thought showing up in different ways. Um, uh, there's also been like, especially with the second wave cognitive behavioral therapy, um, it seems to de-emphasize the body. It seems to de-emphasize emotion. And so the third wave cognitive behavioral approach is uh, tried to correct for that by introducing like mindfulness into uh, the cognitive model. Um, but in, in my view, it's, it's sort of like a, uh, an add-on that doesn't really do a proper revising of the whole framework, um, if that makes any sense. Any other questions before me, we move along here? OK. Um, so we're going to more explicitly uh, talk about some of the issues with the information processing theories. So information processing theories tend to encounter significant problems in accounting for first-person phenomena including qualia, intentionality, self-reflective consciousness, existential time and space, meaning, and human agency. Now, I'm, again, I'm kind of leaving out cognitive behavioral therapy because, again, it's sort of this hybrid. It's, it's, it is dealing with formal and final cause, uh, but, again, it's trying to model that on maybe an <coughs> inappropriate uh, framework. So first-person qualia. Um, just as a reminder, third-person empiricism is trying to assess what's going on from a disinterested third-person perspective. So involving, quotes, objective data, such as Susan has a temperature of 39.3 and is crying. 
from the first person perspective, it might involve more subjective uh, experiences, uh, which might be characterized by the utterance, I, I have a really sore head and I feel really tired. So we might wonder how can a third person science account for first person subjective states? If it cannot, can we say whether they exist? I would say that they do. Um, are they unimportant byproducts of something else? Are they epiphenomenal? So are we going to say that, that, look, really what's going on is this material efficient causal unfolding and all this stuff up here, it's all kind of illusionary. It's all, it has no causal traction. It has no causal power to, to make any change at all, right? Um, so a, a first person subject versus an object, a, a thing in the world, refers to perceived experience in the first person. It involves you, your embodied self, your lived and experienced sensations, feelings, thoughts, and actions. By embodiment, we mean that you, you exist within a body. You have a body. There's a sense of being aware of your body. Um, computers and robots, arguably, they are not embodied, right? They don't have this sense of experiencing itself as navigating in space and, and being able to, uh, to suffer its body in a way. I mean, much of the time, the body for, for us, you know, assuming we're relatively healthy individuals, the body is transparent, right? The body is sort of in the background. We don't notice the body, right? All we notice is, is what we're trying to do, the things that we're engaging with, the conversations that we might be having with people, we don't notice our body usually until there's a problem. Imagine you, again, you're going about your business, you're running through the house, what are you attending to? You're attending to the taxi that's outside that you're trying to catch. You know, you realize that you need to grab your coat first. Things that you're attending to, your body is, is just an instrument to, to make all of that happen. But what, what happens, let's say, is that you trip on the way out and you whack your toe hard, right? And then what happens? Well, let's say you don't hit it that hard, but it, it's, it's painful enough. And you say that my foot hurts, right? Or you say, I have this, this pain in my toe, right? So there's this, this having of something, right? You can recognize your toe as an object over and against your, your thoughts, right? But let's say you hit it really hard. What happens in those first three seconds? Well, there's not, I have a throbbing toe. It, you are that throbbing toe. It's just sensation. It's just pain. There's no thought. The, the pain just absorbs you. It swallows you up in that moment, right? But again, most of the time, there's, there's this kind of, we're dwelling within our body and our perception and intentionality is oriented out toward the world of engagements. We don't notice the body. And again, we don't experience the body as an object. We experience the body as a kind of tool, in a way, to navigate through the world. Um, and these sorts of experiences, again, like, you know, to what extent is a computer able to have that sort of thing, right? It, arguably, it's not embodied. There's, you know, again, inter interesting aspects of our first-person grammar. We have this intuitive understanding. We use these first-personal pronouns, I, me, mine, right? It suggests a sense of ownership, right? <coughs> this is my body. I own this body, I'm in possession of this body, I'm inhabiting this body. And then the pl plural pronoun, right? The, the sense of a, sh a shared existence or a shared way, way of being. We say ours, our, we, us. So there's an understanding of a sense of possession, a sense of ownership. There's no possibility of being confused about whose thoughts these are, I mean, unless you're dealing with some very severe psychosis or something like that, but for normal, everyday being in the world, that's, that's not the case. So there's an epistemic authority, right? A, a knowledge of our own thoughts and these first person experiences. Um, when doing therapy, you know, if, if the therapist has some sense of what's going on, they, they want to present some interpretation uh, uh, and understanding that the client might be able to then make use of, right? The therapist might put that out there, but if it doesn't resonate 
with the client, it's the wrong interpretation, right? The client has that epistemic authority to know whether this is or isn't the case for them. Another strange aspect of you know, first person embodiment is the aspect of our, our headless way of being in the world, right? You don't ever experience your own face unless you're in, looking in front of a mirror. Most of the time, your face is something that is just, it, it moves out of the way so that the world can show up, right? You have other people's faces and they have your face, right? But you don't experience your own face in that way, right? As an object, as a thing. Now, qualia involves the phenomenal aspects of first person experience, the what it's like to have a particular thought, feeling, or sensation. It can involve the, the redness of an apple, the bitterness of a lemon, the feeling of pain. Qualia are, of course, connected with our first person experience or our embodied self consciousness. Now, again, we might ask how can a third person functionalistic theory deal with these very real phenomena. Just because you can build a machine or you can uh, imagine a series of algorithmic instructions that can convert an input into an output, does that, does that guarantee that there's going to be a, a conscious, sentient, what it's like to experience something, right? I doubt very much that, that my phone and as I'm engaging with Siri, I doubt very much, like if I was to ask Siri, Siri, what's it like to be Siri? I'm sure Siri would, would say something, but I don't think it would actually have an experience of, of anything, right? You can get into the artificial intelligence bit and we can say, well, well look, we're, we're physical beings, right? Is it possible that you could somehow, I don't know, like, create or, or, or build a, a robot that could be self-conscious? Maybe. Uh, in, well, theoretically, it should be possible if, if we're biological beings, right? Um, do we have the ability to do that now? Oh, I don't think so. I think that's a long, long way off, you know? Although we have machines that can do some uh, amazing things. So if two people exhibit the same functional behavior or emotional response to a particular input or stimulus, can we say that they have the same subjective experience? You know, can we say that two people who utter the word, you know, strawberry, as, as they're referring to this entity over here, that they have the, the exact same experience internally? Well, to a certain degree, in this instance, maybe, you know, assuming we have like roughly similar nervous systems, is it the exact same? I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, part of it too is, is if you're a conscious being, this entity over here, even something as simple as a strawberry, it has a particular meaning to a given individual. It may have to do with your experience with strawberries, what it's in reference to, how it relates to various memories, you know, perhaps it brings you back to a time where, you know, you were a little child and you're sitting at, at the dinner table and, and your mother would kind of <laughs> hand you these yummy strawberries and you remember this fond little kind of bonding moment or something like that, right? From a, a, a therapy example as well, imagine that you have like two different therapy clients and two different sessions and they come into the session and both of them say, uh, that they're really upset and they, they say, look, you know, my partner told me that they no longer love me and it hurts. And both of them utter the exact same sentence and both of them well up in tears. Are they experiencing the same thing? Right? Some people are saying no. And why is that? Or why might we be inclined to say no? Well, part of it, I think, is, is the, the precise way in which this ties into you know, the relationships, the significance of that relationship and, and, you know, the prior relationships and how this might bear on, you know, the, the larger picture and so on, like all of that is going to be different for an individual. But even more confusingly, right, this is something that's, that's worth knowing. Can we say that the same affect program is being activated in that moment? 
in this case, I would say no. And I would say that just based from experience, right? So when you see someone crying and saying it hurts, I think many of us, we assume that they're experiencing sadness, right? But with some people, if you ask them, like, well, what's going on in your body right now? What's happening in there? Is it like, is it like a heaviness? Is it like a, this kind of weighty, you know, defeated sort of feeling inside, like, like an inertia that pulls you down? Or is this more of a feeling that's kind of riddled with some panic, right? Some apprehension, you know? Uh, and for some people, it's, it's the latter. It's, it's more of this kind of, uh, Panksepp uh, differentiates, um, well, he, he refers to this as, as the panic or the grief system. And it's kind of analogous to like a child who is lost in the grocery store and they can't find their parent. And, and they, they tear up and, and become kind of panicky. And it can look like they are experiencing sadness, but it's actually not sadness. You know, is that kind of strange? Is that kind of weird? Another one is um, when you're talking with someone and you're asking about you know, you know, these, these things and, and to what extent uh, it bothers them or, or how it bears on their understanding of themselves and what's important to them or whatever. And, and it looks like there's nothing going on there. From the outside, it looks like they're calm and they're just engaging in, in a friendly discussion. Nothing happening there at all. They're not fidgeting their hands. They're not kind of like doing the sighing stuff. They're not like scratching their head with anxiety, right? But then when you ask them, some people, what's going on here right now? Because we're talking about some things that would seem to bother you, things that you know, seem to be important. What's going on right now in your body? What's happening in there? What's happening in your throat and your chest and your belly and your head? Like, what's, what's happening? And some people will say, look, I f I f funny that you, know, you mentioned that. I'm feeling queasy in my gut. I'm feeling nauseous. I feel butterflies. And I'm feeling like a tunnel vision sensation. And I got this ringing in my ears that won't stop. And, it, and when did that start? Well, it just started 20 minutes ago, right? Well, what is that? Well, they're in, in a freeze response, uh, neurophysiologically speaking. But you wouldn't know that unless you kind of took seriously their, their inner experience, what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. So again, you know, we can wonder, like, if, if, a, if a computer is engaging in a functional behavior that seems to mimic what a human does, are we justified in saying that they're the same thing? I think I would argue no. Um, existential space and time. So when we think of space, typically what we think of is Cartesian space. You know, space as conceived independent of any particular experiencer. Space as, as an object, a, a thing, a, a landscape. It's a homogenous sort of uh, entity. It involves self-sufficient substances or objects. Self-sufficient in the sense that, again, they don't, they don't kind of tie into a human being and their purposes or meanings or anything like that. It, it's trying to account for them, uh, again, from a disinterested third person perspective. So we say, you know, rocks, chairs, trees, and we attach predicate properties to them. So to predicate again is, is to attach you know, a, a, a conceptual framing to categorize, right? To classify. And we classify it in, in this disinterested way according to length, weight, distance, and so on. So we might say, this book is nine and a half by six by two inches and weighs 1.5 pounds. That would be, you know, uh, according to Cartesian space. So it's space as accounted for by the third person, a generalized or a no person space, right? So it's a no person, it's not from any particular person's perspective. No single individual can take up a generalized perspective, right? Hence the no person. But existential or lived space involves closeness, nearness, farness, involves heavy and light, availability, in reference to one's concern. Something that is close to you, that is proximate in terms of a Cartesian space, Cartesian <coughs> coordinates, may actually be the furthest thing from you in an existential space. 
Well, what do we mean by that? Well, you're clothing right now. For the most part, you're, you're not aware of your clothing, right? It sort of gets absorbed into the background. You don't see it as an object. It becomes transparent to you un unless, there, again, there's a failure of some sort. You kind of rip your shirt and you're concerned about, uh, about that. People are wearing glasses, right? You don't notice the, even the, just the pressure of it on your nose, right? It's, again, it's, it's transparent to you. It's the closest thing to you in a Cartesian sense, but arguably the furthest thing from you um, in an existential sense. So we use the exact same example. We can say this heavy book within reach on my writing table needing to be read, right? So the book is heavy in reference to a single individual's body, perhaps, right? Um, what is heavy to one person might not be heavy to another person. It's heavy perhaps in relation to what you might do with it, right? So it's heavy if I have to carry it to school, but it's not heavy if I have to take it off the bookshelf and, and sit down and read it. Um, and the fact that it's needing to be read, so it gets tied up into your concern, what matters to you, what, what your goals and purposes are, you know, what you're up to, what you're doing. So one of the weird things to, to notice here is that terms such as heaviness and hardness and resistance are more basic, in a sense, or more primordial than the more abstract Cartesian counterparts. Well, why is that? Because first and foremost, we, we are in the world. We are dwelling within the world as self-conscious agents, or we discover ourselves through our engagements with the world. And so the existential space is, is what we encounter first, and how we get to material efficient um, framings is by stripping all meaning, all significance, all purposes and how it relates to a given individual or cultural practices and we strip it of all of that to get to this Cart the Cartesian stuff. Uh, so a, a therapy example of, of this, right, in existential space. I couldn't tell you how many times like in, in a therapy session <coughs> I'm sitting with someone and I will ask someone, where are you right now? Right? Now that sounds like a spatial question, right? Now, if I was sitting across from Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, what would he likely say? Cartesian way. Right, which might sound like this is the Cartesian way, which could sound like I'm, I'm sitting three and a half feet away from you. You know, we're at an angle, you know, of, of 30 degrees to one another. Like it, he would frame it in that way. But what am I doing when I ask that question? Where are you right now? What am I after? Right, right. Now, like yeah, yeah. So, so we could say, where are you in your thoughts? Where are you in your concern? Where are you in your body and in, in how you feel right now? Right? Where are you in terms of how we're relating right now? Right? Are you detached right now? <coughs> are you present with me? <coughs> so that's, that's what we're after with, uh, with existential space. Uh, it also has to do with our involvements or, or you know, uh, our entanglements within the world. So consider the difference between being in this classroom and being in Psych 4434. Those are not quite the same thing. So being in the classroom we can frame as, as you know, Cartesian being in, right? Well, there's this kind of space of a particular, you know, kind of size and coordinates and there's a physical body that is within those coordinates and we say that you're in, right? In the same way that water is in a glass. But being in Psych 4434 has to do with our involvements, right? So, um, so the first is defined in third person, describing a physical entity as spatially located. The second is defined in the first person as he or she relates to the referential whole or context of involvement. The same is true of uh, being in a band, right? As opposed to being in the rock concert hall or something like that. Um, being in a chess club versus being in you know, the library or whatever, wherever people play chess. So that's, um, 
existential space. Um, existential time versus Cartesian time. So the Cartesian time is a third person uh, notion of time. It involves objective measurement, basically what a clock or a calendar indicates, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. It's a homogenous time, has no regard for you and, and your sense of it or what it means to you, nothing like that. It's a unidirectional directional progression from the past, present, and future. Arguably for the physicist, the, the most real coordinates are in the immediacy of the present. The past no longer exists, although it was, and the future is sort of this blurred out, you know, uh, maybe they would interpret in terms of like probabilities or, or something like that. So time as typically conceived seems to have a material efficient causal structure, a universal property of objects and events, it involves change, things like entropy, uh, a continuous and t contiguous stream of events. So continuous, temporally continuous, and contiguous as, as objects and entities are degrading and changing and, and whatnot in this uh, unidirectional sense. Now that's very different though from lived time. This involves first person experience of short periods, long whiles, waiting, and feelings such as excited anticipation and boredom. So we talked about in a previous class briefly uh, that boredom is like this elongation of, of time that time gets stretched out in this unbearable way that you know you feel it as as kind of oppressing you but you feel this sort of squirmy agitated <coughs> sense of wanting to turn away if there's an object or entity that you find boring you just want to turn away from it to get away from this this feeling it's like whatever's happening it's kind of holding you in limbo and time it, it becomes unbearable you know, we talk of wanting to kill time, right? To, to make it hurry along, that sort of thing. Now, our experience, so this is, by the way, uh, I'm talking about this is temporality uh, in the phenomenological sense, and this is one of the existentials, right? Uh, the, the, one of the, the basic, you know, existential predicates or existential categories like if you're a human being like you have the capacity to experience the world in this way through time through lived time that's what we're talking about so time can be slowed in the experience of of boredom um, but it can also be slowed through other experiences such as depression right anyone who has experienced depression most people report that they feel time in a different way it's like the world slows down, uh, but it, it doesn't have that sort of, that same um, angsty, kind of anxious, like wanting to break away, as if, as if you could just solve the problem from turning away from, you know, some object that is boring you, right? In depression, it's like there's this stillness. It's like you're held captive, that you're a prisoner in some way, and you watch the world carrying on in this agony, you know? And minutes feel like just eternity, right? In this really, really painful way. And the world is lacking meaning. It's, it's dull, it's gray. There's nothing that, that draws your attention or pulls you in or, or tries to engage you. You just find yourself kind of stuck and immobilized, right? Um, what are some ways that, uh, so this is, these are examples of, of time as experienced at, in, in slowing down. Uh, what are some ways that, that we might experience time as, quote, flying by? What kinds of things might bring that about? Mm -hmm. Yep. Going on vacation. Going on vacation, right? So you're on vacation, you're, you're having fun, you're having these, you know, kind of fascinating conversations, maybe with different people, you're excited, you're just in this flow, right? And then before you know it, it's like, oh my God, you know, those three days, they're gone, right? Just, just like that. There's this interesting relation with, if, if you are engaged in, in the world and you're just 
going and going and in this kind of flow state, time will move by very quickly. If you're disengaged in some way, time will feel oppressive. Our experience of time has a lot to do with, with our, the object of our concern, where our concern lies, right? Well, my concern is not here, it's not here, it's over there, right? I want time for that, not time for this, right? This sort of thing. Um, so it's, it's also, it's not just unidirectional, right? Um, you know, like we have the ability to reflect back upon things that had happened. You know, that's a lot of what therapy is in a way. It's like, well, let's, you know, we can't, we can't change the fact that, you know, that you had this horrible experience you know, at some point in your life. But we can go back here in, in our thoughts and we can try to engage it in a different way. Engage it in terms of how we interpret it and engage it in terms of the, the relevant feelings that maybe were not able to be experienced or validated at that time. Yeah. So, um, like in the sense that like in your, in your concern, like in your mental um, attention, right? Like e even here, right? Like you can, you guys, I mean, it's probably happening right now. Like you're trying to pay attention, but your, your mind is, is on this argument that you had with someone this morning, right? That's where your, your concern lies. And that's all we mean. We're not talking about like teleportation machines or anything like that, right? right? So, yeah. Um, so again, we can ask, is, is this way of experiencing time an illusion? I, I don't think so. Uh, and we can, we can wonder, well, can we program a computer to experience boredom? And if so, would that actually be boredom? I don't think so. We can program a computer, I'm sure, to, to mimic or model, you know, what we might behaviorally label as boredom. But uh, I think we would doubt whether that would be the, the same phenomena. Primordial intentionality. So the capacity of the mind, so, so the primordial means basic, fundamental, right? So it's a, a fundamental form of intentionality. It's the capacity of the mind to be directed on, toward, or about something, whether it's physically present or not. It's involved in basic perception, understanding of our goals, beliefs, desires, intentions, um, hopes, fears, and so on. So just even that example that I just used, that, that's a form of intentionality. The thing that you're concerned with, the thing that you're engaged with, where your attention goes, it's directed in some way, whether towards some, um, some project or pursuit or you know, some relationship dynamic, or whatever it is, that we have this ability to comport ourselves in that way. So it's the structure of lived experience and psychic comportment. So comportment is kind of a, a technical term, but it, it means essentially, um, it's a kind of behavior, but it's a behavior, like a psychic, like an orienting. It's like, um, again, the, the direction of, of your attentional capacity or that you have that ability to direct your attention. I mean, so right now, like you're maybe trying to make sense of words that I'm, I'm putting forth. But you know, I can invite you to just notice you know, your, your feet against the floor and be aware of your toes. And I can suggest that you wiggle your toes so you can remember that your toes are a part of your body. I can suggest, you know, like, well, notice your breathing. And do you notice that when you breathe in through your nose that it's kind of a cooler sensation than the warm air that comes out, right? And you can do that, right? It's not that, I mean, this is interesting to talk about too. In therapy, like, would we say that the therapist's words cause the person in therapy to get better in a material efficient sense. I think that would be kind of bizarre, wouldn't it? I think what we're doing is we're making use of their intentional capacity and we're inviting them to engage with some part of their experience that is relevant to the difficulties that they want to resolve. So it's not like my words, I can't do that, right? And it's the person's decision in a way, like they, they're the only ones that have that ability. You can just draw attention to something and say, look, I think this is important. Do you think it would be good to attend to this thing here? And they can either do that or not, right? You can't make that happen, you know? 
So it's the act of directing itself toward something. Unlike computers, humans have a spatial temporal point of view and an embodied sense of self. Again, it's, it's a lived here from which they can differentiate a, a there. An experienced now, in the existential sense of lived time, from which they can determine a before and a later. This is what it is to be embodied. It grounds just very basic perception, a framing, as well as a full-blown self-awareness or true agency that involves like explicit beliefs, desires, intentions in the sense that we can turn them into conceptual abstractions and play around with them in a symbolic way. Right? All of that is, is based on or emerges from this just very basic phenomenal way of being in the world. Not as, as an object, as a thing, but as an entity, again, that's embodied. So, in a material efficient sense, the causal direction is kind of <laughs> one way. It's from external stimuli to the sensory receptors of the body or the brain as, as an object or a thing or a set of processes that creates the mental experience. So again, we have like uh, electromagnetic light energy that impinges upon the retina that moves through you know, the op optic nerve and, and tracks and lateral geniculate lands in the striate cortex and somehow all this causal stuff creates a sensory experience of some kind. Right? That's the Cartesian kind of scientific understanding of, of, of what all that is, uh, which is fine. But intentionality in the way that we're describing here, it seems to kind of reach out in a way from the subject, the embodied self. It typically involves volitional activity uh, versus just a mere focal attention in the service of some practical engagement or goal intelligible in some way to the first person subject. So again, if, if you're holding an apple in front of your face, like in a way you are determining how long you gaze at that apple. Like you are you know, in volitional control of that, unless there's some kind of neurological problem. Um, and that's something that we need to account for. So intentionality seems to point in the opposite direction of traditional material efficient causality. The third person science has a hard time explaining the human gaze that looks out toward meaningful engagements within the world. Um, I really like this, this Heidegger quote here. I think it sums up a whole lot in a few short lines. The person is not a thing, not a substance, not an object. A person is a performer of intentional acts which are bound together by the unity of meaning. And we can use meaning there in, in a number of different ways, but you know, again, bound together in you know, a, a referential totality of involvements and significant structures and you know, objects of concern uh, you know, your intention, I intend to do this and not to do that. And, you know, I appropriate this, you know, kind of meaningful course of action because it bears on my understanding of myself in some meaningful way. All of that is, is all kind of tied together in this. Computers or machines seem to be useful, a useful analog when we focus only on function, only on, on what it is able to do in a sense. They might even pass the Turing test, which we'll talk about briefly. So operating syntactically, so syntax is essentially operating at the level of efficient cause. The machine mimics or resembles human consciousness, yet it still does not account for meaning, uh, semantics, you know, meaning in the human sense as experienced by people. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you a clip here that will maybe kind of make some of this clear. I think we've been talking about it in a roundabout way, but...
Sixty Second Adventures in Thought, Number Three: The Chinese Room. Can a machine ever be truly called intelligent? American philosopher and Rhodes scholar John Searle certainly can. In 1980, he proposed the Chinese Room thought experiment in order to challenge the concept of strong artificial intelligence, and not because of some 80s design fad. He imagines himself in a room with boxes of Chinese characters he can't understand and a book of instructions which he can. If a Chinese speaker outside the room passes him messages under the door, Searle can follow instructions from the book to select an appropriate response. The person on the other side would think they're chatting with a Chinese speaker, just one who doesn't get out much. But really, it's a confused philosopher. Now, according to Alan Turing, the father of computer science, if a computer program can convince a human they're communicating with another human, then it could be said to think. The Chinese room suggests that, however well you program a computer, it doesn't understand Chinese. It only simulates that knowledge, which isn't really intelligence. But then sometimes humans aren't that intelligent either. So, again, the idea is is that there are sort of messages or inputs, we'll say, that are being passed through. Into this Chinese room where there's a John Searle guy sitting there, and he, all he's doing is is、uh, matching symbols. Doesn't know what the symbols mean. Doesn't know what it refers to. Anything like that. It's just matching, and then sending out the appropriate symbol. The person on the outside that is able to receive it as input, <coughs> as something intelligible, then thinks that that there's this room that's conscious or something like that, or that there's a sense of understanding or meaning or or, or whatever. When in fact there's there's not,、um, that was the point of that. So, when there's this, it's operating just a, according to、uh, rules or just syntax or just at the level of of efficient causality. But again, there's there's no there's no meaning involved in it, right? And that's arguably how computers work, right? They're just following、um, programmed instructions. But th- but that's even wrong because there's no. There's no、uh, self-conscious agent doing the following. Do you understand me, right? So even in, in this example, there's John Searle in there doing the matching, right? There's nothing like that in a computer. It's it's just the on and off switching of transistors according to you know some software program, right? You guys, have any questions about that? Yes. Oh, yes. 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 That's that's exactly right. But、um, like even even there though, it's like so. Could you program a, a program to to switch its program with the appropriate? Like, I mean, you can have like a, a debugging system. So when an error message comes up, then an automatic debugging script turns on or something. Like you can do all that. But again, you're still stuck in this efficient cause thing. Like, if you want to ask the question, like, what would it take to build a self-conscious robot? I don't know the answer to that, but I would clumsily kind of say, well, you would have to build a robot that would discover itself in the world. Like, you would have to build it. Like, you couldn't program the world into the robot. It would like, have to be able to experience regret or something. Well, you. It would have to experience itself as as. Uh, as a separate entity, yeah, th- that's exactly right. Yeah,、um, and and how you would do that, like I don't think anyone knows how you would do that. Is is it possible? I presume so because we're physical entities, right? But、um, so what meaning a, a functional computer has is derived from the conscious human agents who programmed it. Modern computers cannot, by will or volition, modify its function by creating, inhibiting, or rewriting the rules on the basis of which it acts. So, when my daughter is building Lego, and she's following a set of instructions, right, to build this thing,、uh, and we compare that to like a machine that might do the same thing, will cr- create the same output. Let's say, those are two totally different things, right? My daughter at any point can say, "I don't want to do these instructions. I, I want the red block to go here, or I need the door to be bigger for my little puppy, right? Like, or, or something like that." A computer is not able to do that. A computer just runs through the scripts, and it's not—it's not aware of itself as engaging in a script-following procedure, right? That's—that's that's the issue there. Are you with me on that? Does that? 
Make sense? So it needs a, a programmer to do a lot of this. Uh, we give symbolic meaning to the code, which allows us to even say somewhat questionably that computers process information. So the information or the output is output for the person who is ultimately in, informed in some way, right? I mean, if the world, like you could say that, well, computers store information and, and even books. We have, you know, all this information in books. Well, if the world just blew up in a way and all humans just dropped dead, we would wonder, like, does the information still exist? Or, or is it just, you know, potential information, you know, assuming that another human-like entity were to come along and make use of this thing, right? So again, a computer is not informed as a result of its computational process, though, again, people can be. Even terms like inputs and outputs only make sense as metaphors since they presuppose human beings capable of framing the data as meaningful. A computer manipulates symbols through syntax. Manipulates is, you know, scare quotes because it's, it, again, it's, it's just an efficient cause process. It's not actually volitionally kind of doing something in the way that John Searle is in that, that Chinese room thought experiment. It's not embodied or suffici sufficiently embedded within its environment or self-aware such that it could understand uh, and bring these issues into question in a way that would matter to the computer. Modern computers have no anxiety about what the processing means or how it could be used to live a meaningful life. It has no experience of live time or fear of death. These are all ways in which we are very, very different. Human thinking is intentional typically referring to volitional mental comportment for some end or purpose as opposed to an event that just happens. It's useful to kind of uh, contrast some of these different terms or, or words. Like when you, when you think of like efficient cause, like we're thinking about just events, just an unfolding of, of motion and change, right? As opposed to doing, which involves perhaps like a volitional action, right? And, I mean, you can make the case that, well, it's not really a doing, it's, it's an eventing or something like that. You can do that, but you want to have the terms that you can kind of separate those two things to try to get as clear as possible on what you're talking about. So human thinking can be and often is self-conscious, deliberate, self-aware. There's a quote from Reichlack, meaning is an essential ingredient in that it is through a transcending dialectical capacity. So dialectical means that you can engage in oppositional thinking, right? Um, you can attend to what is and then consider its opposite by implication. That the human being can derive implications to the opposite of what he or she is now thinking. We affirm this meaning as opposed to that meaning and behave for the sake of the former or the latter depending on the purpose we are choosing or intending to create, that is, bring about, attain, express, and so on. It's, it's interesting, like, when you hear people speak, and, and some, of the, um, some of these computational-type assumptions kind of make their way into our everyday way of speaking. Like, how many people have heard people say, let me process that for a minute, right? I always kind of chuckle when I hear someone say that. I know what they mean, right? But is that the same thing as what's happening when a computer is processing something? No, I don't think so. What that means is, is that let me think about this. Let me ponder it. And I'm not going to ponder it in some algorithmic way. I'm going to dissect it. I'm going to pull it apart. I'm going to see what you in, intend to say here. And I'm going to check out the, the hidden premises and see if it makes sense. And then I'm going to report back to you what I think about it. Right? People do that. You know. Uh, but that's not what, uh, what a computer is doing, right? So unlike modern computers, meaning to a human being is crucial. It speaks to what matters, what shows up as intelligible or worth doing, what we ought to strive toward or cherish. And of course, we can dialectically interrogate the symbolic action systems that constitute our lives, ask whether any of it is really meaningful, or whether our lives are based on irrational assumptions or comfortable illusions. This is all beyond the pale of anything that a computer could do, I would argue. 
Um, is this making sense to you, that there's something important in, in this, or that it's not neatly kind of reduced without remainder to efficient cause processes? Well, it's, it's fascinating what those folks at uh, Boston Dynamics are, are doing with their robots, right? It's just like, whoa, um, some pretty cool stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, there's this whole kind of fascinating uh, artificial intelligence kind of debates and, and kind of where that's going. It's been a couple of years since I've been following it. But um, I, I think, like, people are recognizing that uh, if you're going to build some artificial intelligence, you're going to have to do it in a Heideggerian sense. So there's the Heideggerian AI, which is, so rather than the old attempts, which are that you have to program into the computer, um, you know, the various algorithms and how to respond to specific stimuli, and you're programming all that in there as well, right? And you run into all kinds of problems, like the frame problem, combinatorial explosion, all these kind of weird things. But but uh, you have to build a system that uses the world itself as a reference point, right? And once you start doing that, then you're on the right track, you know? But then it's, it's uh, again, I think it's still pretty, pretty complicated to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, we're going to wrap up there for today. Um, uh, office hours after class, if anyone has any questions, uh, be a good place to sort that out.